Hi there, and welcome to lecture number 11. We're on to beer in the Middle Ages. Um, and let me begin by asserting, or rather reasserting, that beer for the vast majority of people in the Middle Ages was not merely a tipple to enjoy after work or while carousing with friends on the weekend or however it may be um, today when we drink beer. It was first and foremost a form of nourishment. Um, it was a provider of a major proportion of calories in the average person's diet. And the estimated daily consumption, for example, in England in the 14th century was about a gallon a day. Now, I'm not exactly sure how they measure such things. Usually it's by allotment within um, institutions where they actually measure them. But um, if that's accurate, it's a whole lot of beer. Um, now, that may have been small beer, meaning um, very low in alcohol content, but still, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of any liquid, actually, to drink in a day. But all the evidence from every person who's looked at this very closely um, points to the fact that people drank um, a massive quantity of beer on a daily basis. Um, and I think that, you know, lends support to the idea I have proposed that beer is foremost a food, right? It's a nourishing food. It's not something, um, you know, that you have one of and enjoy with a meal. It's actually, it is the calories that you're, you're burning. Um, and I think what's also very interesting is most medieval people really don't seem to have had a concept of the psychological or physical addiction to alcohol. That's, that's a, a very, very modern concept. Um, what we call alcoholism doesn't exist. Now, of course, they know there is a state of drunkenness, and they know that some people get drunk a lot and do it habitually, of course, um, but there isn't the kind of um, social stigma, and obviously not the the kind of medicalization that we have in the modern era. Um, that's that's really quite unique in history. Um, you know, people have of course known and um, that people get drunk, but there, it wasn't um, there wasn't this concept of alcoholism that we have today. And I would say, unlike wine in Northern Europe, which of course is a marker of status, beer is exactly the opposite. It's, it's a common drink. Every person, man, woman, and most importantly, children also uh, drank beer. Um, but what is interesting, nonetheless, is the story I'm gonna to tell today um, parallels that of wine insofar as the production shifted from rather small scale household brewing, which is largely done by women, uh, to an industrial scale brewing that is mostly done by men. Um, and they're often organized into um, collective um, bodies called guilds. And the beer that they make also differs in many ways, especially because it's made for export. It's not made in the household or for immediate neighbors to be sold. It's made as a business. So in that sense, the, the changes in the beer industry in the late Middle Ages parallel those of wine but we'll see it's still a very different beverage. Um, and intertwined with this whole story is a fascinating um, uh, story of uh, government regulation and taxation, which actually encourages this uh, industrialization of beer growth. The, the control of alehouses is certainly part of um, what governments want to do. Uh, purity laws, which we'll see are not really you know, we tend to think, oh, they're the interest in the customer and, and health. Um, their interest is really maintaining the quality of the product so it will sell abroad. Um, and most importantly, there are some very interesting technological developments uh, in this period which make the beer higher in alcohol, again, like wine. Um, and eventually, and I think the most important part of this story is the um, humulus lupulus, is hops change beer entirely. Hopped beer will will um, ship much further, long distances, it will last relatively long periods, so it's, it's a much more stable product. Um, and we'll see that that changes the nature of where beer can go um, and how. Um, and, and we'll see also, I think that governments tended to prefer large-scale brewing, and they tend to, because they can um, um, they can tax it more efficiently. It's very hard to tax a woman making beer in her house. Um, they also, uh, you know, will legislate very consistently to favor large-scale production um, and because they want things to be better organized and better um, better equipped to, to ship far because they can tax it better. So, so this is, again, it's really a matter of tax revenue. And you'll see that's a theme that goes throughout the course from this point on is when governments 
on the one hand say we want to control drinking um, it's largely because they want to control that revenue in taxes um, so much much of this industrial history of beer I'm drawing from an excellent book let me let me recommend it to you it's by Richard W Unger um, and it's um, and I'll also talk a bit about the social and cultural aspects of beer consumption which he doesn't go into too much um, that's drawn from other authors such as um, Aylin Martin some, has some excellent books on beer consumption. And then there's a little bit drawn from what, what I can think is a very good book on beer and brewing by Ian Hornsey. Um, and you'll see there's a couple of other sources like um, Women and Brewsters and um, by um, I think Joan Bennett's the author of that. But in any case, you'll see there's a lot of really good books on this topic I want to recommend to you if you want to go into further detail. Um, we have also to contend with the fact that medieval people um, really drank a lot more beer than we do nowadays. Um, it was the primary beverage in place of water. It was consumed at every meal, um, which, and the meal times, I should mention, um, they generally ate their bigger meal earlier in the day, about 11, and then they would eat a smaller meal around five or six, which is supper. So dinner is the first one in the, in the um, late afternoon, in the, in the uh, morning, and then five or six early evening um, is dinner. And, and in rural areas, some people would eat a breakfast, which is the very first thing in the morning, especially if you're a farm worker and you want to be out uh, by daylight. You'll actually eat slightly before the sun comes up. You'll have a little break, a break to break your fast, right? Um, but that also includes beer, which seems kind of weird to us. You know, you think, of oh God, you're waking up first thing in the morning. But keep in mind, there's no coffee or tea, right? There's no caffeinated beverages yet. And you need hydration first thing in the morning, as everyone knows. Uh, you're thirsty. From, um, and... Beer is the safest thing to drink. So in terms of production, we can be a lot more certain um, than among ancient brewing techniques. We, we have more details about how they did it um, because there are a lot of written records, of course. Um, in this case, they are almost always talking about barley. They don't mix. They generally don't mix beer with other things like they did in ancient times. And it, the barley um, would have almost always been malted. In other words, they're going to sprout it because that will help change the um, starches and sugar, the enzymes in those. Um, and what usually the way this would be done is you spread the grain on the floor about five inches thick in a big room. You wet it all so it will you know start to germinate. And then you drain that off, and the grain is, so it doesn't stay wet, which would cause it to rot. It's just moist, so the grain kind of wakes up and says, oh, I'm ready to go. And then it's raked every now and then, so everything is aerated and doesn't get moldy. And then all of a sudden, it just, you know, sprouts a, a little sprout, and then it, which would have been the taproot, basically, of the grain. And then it is stopped. Um, and the way they do this is they take that grain, they then shovel it into a either a kiln or they will actually have a low peat fire in the room somewhere, so it's smoky, or sometimes they'll have a slatted floor and they'll make a fire underneath and it'll the smoke all rises up and goes through the slats in the floorboard and the whole upper room dries and smokes, which is really the most effective way to do it. It's great. Um, and uh, the idea is to get it as dry as possible to stop that germination in in its tracks after the sprout is maybe about an inch or so long. That's That's the ideal time. And then the um, then of course they they will grind the uh, the malted grain when it's when they're ready to use it they'll grind it fairly coarsely into what is called grist okay um, that just means like meal kind of texture okay and when it's ready to become beer the grist is soaked with warm water it's about 150 degrees they put this in a big sort of um, wooden vat called a mash tun, T-U-N. Remember that word, like tonnage, tun, tons are, are barrels. It's a big barrel kind of thing. Um, and that, that actually, that whole action is called mashing, okay? That's, I know you're not, not like mashing potatoes, but it's, it's, a, it's a kind of mush that you get out of it. Um, what happens then is all the valuable carbohydrates, all the sugars, all the proteins are uh, leach into that hot water, right, as, as it cooks. And then that's drained off. And then what you have, of course, is a dark brown sweet liquid called wort. Do you remember that word? Um, and then what's interesting, actually, because you'll see that there are parallel industries that draw off of each other, the spent grains, what's called draff, D-R-A-F-F, -F, is then um, used to feed animals. So you'll quite often have either a 
pig um, rearing operation or a dairy. So you'll feed the draft to cattle sometimes. Um, it's still got nutrients in it. It's actually, and in fact, there's a couple of bakeries that are starting to use the leftover draft from um, from breweries and they put it in bread and things, which is, it's got an interesting taste. Um, but usually it's dried, usually it's fed to animals, it's, uh, as today even, uh, to, to pigs or cattle. And then what they do is they take this wort, they have this uh, hot, this um, sweet brown liquid, uh, they boil it, and, and ideally in copper. Copper is very, heats very evenly and it's consistent. Um, and by the 15th century, um, they start adding hops. But before that, there's something else which is called kraut, okay, in, um, in Dutch, G-R-U-I-T. It's, it's cognate to the word kraut, which just means vegetables, and that's basically what it is, um, or herbs, let's say, that's what it really means in Dutch. Um, and what this contains at the time could be a variety of different things. We're actually not exactly sure ex what it always would be, but the kraut would contain mugwort primarily. In fact, that's the word in English, of course, means mugwort it's for putting in your beer, right? Okay. Mugwort is Artemisia vulgaris. And, and it is related to Artemisia absinthum, right? That whole Artemisia um, genus is uh, southern wood, absinthe, and um, a handful of other herbs like mugwort, okay? They would also put in sweet gale. They would sometimes put in yarrow, which is a beautiful yellow flowers, quite a bitter um, herb. Maybe things like tansy but went into it. Um, and once in a while, sometimes henbane. And henbane is um, one of those hallucinogenic drugs that we studied at the very beginning of the class. So maybe this has got, this has got an extra kick to, to it, this early beer. Um, many manufacturers would add uh, spices also. Uh, juniper um, gives it a nice astringency. It's the flavor, of course, of gin. That would go into beer. Sometimes they put bog myrtle in, which is a really interesting herb. Um, various astringent herbs. So the more astringency you have, um, the, the greater the resistance to bacterial growth and spoiled beer, okay? Um, so, th so these things act as preservatives to some extent. Um, what you then do is the wort is cooled down, remember, because you don't want to kill off the yeast if it's too hot, and then you add the yeast, um, and in the past, what you would do is you generally scrape the top, the foamy top from the previous batch, you'd save that, and then you'd add it to the, the next batch, right? Um, today, of course, brewer's yeast comes in little packets and they just pitch it in, um, or it's, sometimes it's moist, but it's, it's, always, it's industrially made. Um, and the yeast is what turns those sugars into CO2, which is where you get the bubbles, and alcohol is the, the byproduct for this whole thing. Um, and in fact, this is usually done at room temperature, okay? So this is, this is what, what we're technically talking about here is ale, okay? Um, now recognize, there are two completely different types of fermentation. One of them, in one of them, the yeast floats on the top of the beer. In another one, the yeast floats on the bottom. And that's the two major distinctions between types of beer. Um, almost all beer in the Middle Ages is top fermented. Um, the difference is that you can only do bottom fermented with a different type of yeast and in colder temperatures, okay? That's, that's key to this kind. Um, the exception is um, Bohemia, which made a thing called Pilsner, um, which is the kind of the prototype of most mass-produced American beer, or what, what we would call lager. Okay? And when we say, we say beer generically, we're usually talking about light lager, which is cold and bottom fermented. Um, now, these words have come to be very, very confusing in, in actual usage, the difference between beer and ale. All fermented grain products like this are technically beer. Ale is a kind of beer. Um, but originally, ale meant unhopped beer, um, and beer meant, if you use the word beer, it meant that you put hops in it. So that's, that's where our kind of modern um, meaning comes, but today all ale also contains hops. So I know that's confusing. That, that also that uh, sort of a distinction doesn't really exist anymore today. Um, almost all beer uses, uses hops. Uh, but ale, the, the distinction does still hold that ale is top fermented, like it would have been done in the Middle Ages, and beer usually means bottom fermented, kept at cold temperatures, okay? Very important distinction. They're made different ways. Um, the latter is harder, okay? Um, 
But again, confusingly, everything brewed from grain is technically beer. <laughs> okay, so um, the other dif distinction um, and something that probably would surprise you is most modern beer is, um, is filtered or it's fine, like you'd use products like Isinglass. Isinglass, strangely, is the swim bladder of a sturgeon, and they use that to get all the particulate matter out and all the grit. Um, in the Middle Ages, this would be still in the beer. It would normally also, remember, have been stored in an oak cask, so it's gonna get that oaky flavor and the tannins and the vanillins and the flavors that come out of the oak, just like wine would today. Then, um, of course, they didn't have stainless steel or <laughs> cement or anything else to ferment in, so, so beer would have this oaky flavor also, which you can find some beers today still do. Um, it would also be cloudy, right? I mean, it's not gonna be a clear beer. There's no, nothing, nothing quite like that. Um, Oak conditioning is something today, traditional brewers still do it. You can go to Britain and get oak cask conditioned beers. Um, today they do it for flavor, but as you can imagine, it's it's more expensive because you have to keep a barrel around um, and you run the risk of bacterial infection because it is it is somewhat exposed to the outside elements. And as you drink the beer, of course, it lowers and there's air in there in contact with it. So, um, and I think what is um, different today about beer is, of course, they put it, when they, they are fermenting it, they put it in stainless steel containers. They keep the oxygen out, so there's no risk of, of contamination. Um, but it also means the natural carbonation is kept in. So the major difference, if you were to plop down and be tasting beer in the Middle Ages, is that it would have been flat, okay? Um, and it would definitely not have been chilled. Okay, this is not, not cold out of the fridge. Um, there's no real way to get it below, say, I mean, unless you put it on ice, which, which I've never heard of anyone doing back then. So, so if you happen to show up in Britain, it's not, it's not warm, but it's, it's kind of, um, it's not ice cold either. And in many, um, t t well, let me just speak the truth. Okay, if you really want to taste beer, taste it around room temperature, you will find all the faults in it immediately. Um, taste a beer like a, well, you know, any cheap American beer at room temperature, it will be horrible. It'll be skunky and you know, it's just, just nasty stuff. That's why we serve it ice cold <laughs> or, or we squeeze a lime in it, which is even worse. Um, so, so the chilling obviously hides the flavors and mutes all the imperfections. Um, but a beer should be palatable at, um, slightly under room temperature is about right. 55 is actually perfect because your palate can still pick up all the flavors and it's not going to be ice cold, but it's not going to be, um, you know, obviously you would, wouldn't want to drink it at 80, <laughs> 80 degrees. So slightly chilled is, is fine. Um, and medieval beer, of course, is going to be whatever room temperature is. So this entire procedure would have originally been done for most of the Middle Ages in the household. It's part of a woman's daily chores, especially if she's in a rural setting in a village or on a farmstead. The, um, you know, task of making beer would be, uh, you'd do it every week or so. You know, you'd make a small quantity. And the batches obviously are not gonna be any bigger than one person could, fig you know, handle physically. So, so it's gonna be done fairly regularly, depending on the size of the household, right? You might have to do it more often. If you had a smaller household, you'd do it less often. Um, so there is not really much incentive to make a big batch because the bigger your batch, the more likely it is to go bad by the time you've gotten to the end of it. It's never traveling far. It's not shaking around. It's not in a, you know rolling around in a barrel. So, so the way beer was generally sold in a even in cities is that a woman, her name she's called a Brewster. You've heard that word, right? It's it, it is a female term. She would specialize. Um, you know, if you're in a city, maybe the production is a little bigger. Maybe she has some equipment that's not, you know, used for cooking and for brewing, some, some specialized equipment. Um, she might have a separate brew house devoted to it. It may actually be her profession, right? I mean, it, she, may, she may make a living doing this. Um, and how she would do that is she's selling directly to her neighbors, right? They show up, they bring a, a pail or a bucket or a, a jug of some kind. Um, and sometimes she would actually even maintain a space. So if they just wanted a, a mug, they could drink it right there on the premises. Um, this is a great way for a person to supplement their household income. Uh, and presumably the man of the household um, would be off doing another job. Or she could, in some circumstances, actually even own the establishment herself and um, um, 
run it herself, you know, make the beer and serve it. Obviously, if it gets a little bigger, she needs more more hands, but these tend to be small. Uh, some We have even records of people selling it from their door. You know, you knock on the door, someone opens the door, <laughs> hands you a beer, and you, and you take it away. Um, that's not uncommon. But the difference is of, is, of course, if you're handling beer on a larger scale, one person cannot manage it physically to move it or to boil it or to, you know, however. Um, so, so in operations like that, men would be hired to do the heavier work. You would definitely have a devoted workshop that would be in production all the time, not your household kitchen. And you would, um, and it would become the primary money-making venture of the whole household, right? The man and woman would be working in it and maybe the children and maybe hired help and whatever it may be. It's a, it's a larger operation um, and they would be brewing all the time. And the, but the difference is, is that this is still essentially household brewing, right? They, they would live in the same space, maybe behind it or above or whatever. Um, and um, the difference is that when you start to capitalize, in other words, when you have money to invest and you say, I'm really going to increase scale and I'm going to sell to more and more people and I'm going to make a business out of this, you need a staff that's entirely devoted to brewing. You need equipment that's going to cost a lot of money to invest in. And of course, you need a factory right, of some kind that, that will have a clean water source that will have a uh, ready fuel because you're heating stuff up, a place to store the grain, a place to do the, you might do the malting yourself, you probably buy the malt from someone else who has bought it from the farmer. So you can see there's a lot of different stages involved now. Um, and this is when the government opens an eye and says, hmm, this is happening and we want to control it. We'll see why they want to control it. I, I argue it's for tax reasons, but it's also for other reasons, public safety, things like that. Um, and the and the other person who will come in to this whole operation is, of course, once the beer is made, it's less often the manufacturer who's selling directly to the consumer. It's quite often there's a middleman who will take it and distribute it or sell it somewhere else or send it to a tavern or send it to a nearby town or anywhere, right? And he's not the person who's making it. He's buying it from them. He's charging more and hiking up the price, and that's how he makes his profit. But it means something fundamentalist happened here with capitalism, right? The, the consumer and the producer are not connected anymore. Okay, and this is where it begins, right? This is where the, the, and this is why I say industrial. It really doesn't have to do with machines per se, or obviously not, you know, modern technology machines, but, um, but it has to do with a different setup of money and, um, and a different, different working model, right? So, and lastly, of course, you know, the end of this whole line of development is you have a proper factory. You have rigid organization, you have labor that is paid wages, you have, uh, you know, capital that's invested in very large machines, and you have an owner who really is not running this out of his household. He's doing it as an investment, right? He puts his money in and expects profit, and if it doesn't profit, he closes it. It's, you know, not, not doing it for fun. Um, those begin to emerge in the 17th century. And of course, in sub subsequent centuries, you have increased mechanization. When, you, when we, we get to the Industrial Revolution, you'll see brewing is one of the most um, mechanized industries um, when we get to the 19th century. Um, now, you know, what's weird is that if you go into a city through the whole early modern period, I know we're not there quite yet, but you'd have very different kinds of operations in uh, there at the same time in the same place. You'd have household breweries, you'd have larger industrial breweries, you'd have... Uh, you know, and you'd also, of course, have any estate's going to brew its own beer. A monastery is going to have its own brew for the monks or sometimes for sale. Um, sometimes the military will have its own brewing operations to feed this to uh, feed the soldiers. Yeah. Um, so, so there's different organizations for labor involved in beer production. I don't want you to think that it's all this and then it's that and then it changes to this. There's there's a very subtle variation and gradations, um, but of course earlier parts go extinct because they can't compete with larger ones. So in any case, the um, so the historical development, let's get back to the Middle Ages specifically, is that there's increasing professionalization, there is increasing scale of the operation, there's shipping the greater and greater distances, and consistently there is the marginalization of women as part of that labor force. Um, Commercial brewing is almost always connected to cities um, and waterways, and of course they're they're providing beer for a larger market. There's concentrated capital, and there is in cities, of course, regular labor force. Right, the ch labor's cheap there. There's lots of people who need work. 
Um, and it always, almost always, always means that there's a wealthy investor who can put money down. He's got it sitting around capital, right? To put into larger equipment and, um, make into a big business, right? Um, water is essential for this whole process, partly because you need clean water to make beer, but you also need water to transport beer, okay? It's not something you want to put on horses and try and trudge around, although within the city, of course, you do that, but if, for distance, you want to be on a waterway, definitely. Um, so, so breweries tend to be situated along rivers. Um, I think because these operations therefore are highly visible, people, everyone can see them for all the river traffic, they see breweries there, um, they get the attention of governments who see this as a really viable source of long-term revenue. Um, and we know this because there are extensive legal proceedings for tax evasion, for quality control and um, price control, for breaking guild regulations. You know, that's, that's really how we know what was going on inside of breweries. You know, people didn't write down diaries what, what they were doing in these operations. They, they ended up in court all the time because they were breaking <laughs> rules. Um, now, I should mention here what the importance of the guilds was okay because what we're talking about is a pre-capitalist society okay this is again late middle ages um and for much of the middle ages there actually were no restrictions on brewing you could do whatever you wanted um but consistently through that period as the population rises as cities get bigger the guilds get much more powerful um and to explain what a guild means it's a it's an organization in which you have to pass various tests to get into. You have to do a masterpiece, for example, um, and, and an apprentice for, for many years before you can even apply to join the guild. But they are, it's very different from today. It's not capitalism. You can't just walk into a city and set up a business and say, I'm gonna try and open a brewery here. And if you have the money, do it. That doesn't work that way in the past. Um, the number of breweries is fixed by the guild. They don't want too much competition. The number of workers is strictly limited because they don't want the labor to be devalued by a rush of excess labor. You understand that? There's lots of people who want jobs. They say, mm, we'll pay them a little less. Who cares? And then the value goes down. If you fix the amount of people who can work at any given time, their wages remain very high. Maybe artificially, you'd say, if you're thinking like a capitalist, but this is for them, this is very good. They want those wages high. Um, so in order to brew, you have to become a member of the guild and you can't just sign up and pay your dues. It doesn't work that way. The guild basically wants to keep the supply, uh, not just of labor, but of the product. They want to keep that static because if the market is flooded with beer, someone's going to have really cheap, crappy beer and sell it, right? And what happens then is the reputation of that city's beer goes whoosh, right down. So they want to maintain very high quality standards and they want to keep the production um, at least they want to control it, at least so the prices will remain high and so the quality is as high as they can be. Um, so to let's imagine you wanted to work in the brewing industry. Let's say I want to become a brewer and you weren't born into that trade. Well, first of all, as a boy, you would have to apprentice. And this is some, somewhere between seven and maybe 14 years old. You would be you would go and live in the household of a brewer and um, become your own pretty much adopted by that family. You work there, they feed and clothe you and house you, and you do all the absolute grunt work. You're shoveling the, the, the grain, you're filling your wood or, or fuel into the fires, you're doing every, you're cleaning, uh, you're carrying heavy stuff. So this is, this is the, the worst part of the part of the job. Um, but you learn the trade doing this, right? You, you learn all the different parts of it and you, you basically um, are, this is your education more or less, right? When you re become an adult, and this is various different definitions, let's imagine you're 17 or 18. Um, you could technically become then a journeyman, which means you can leave that shop, you can go and get work somewhere else. Um, and hired for, for in fact, wages, better wages. And, and this is, these are the people who have the technical skill to judge when the wart is ready, when to pitch the yeast, when to do all sorts of things like that. They are the specialists, right? Um, and they are paid better because they are, you know, um, skilled laborers, more or less. Um, and those are the people who would be most likely to apply for a um, guild, full guild membership. They're not members of the guild yet. And to do that, 
if you want to set up your own business, you have to produce a masterpiece. You have to satisfy the guild that you can meet their quality standards. And, um, and if you get, and they only, and guild openings, you know, positions in the guild only open up when someone else dies because they just don't want a rush of people who are masters in the guild because then again, it's a glut of, of product and cheaper. Um, and what's weird is once you're a member of the guild, they provide a kind of insurance for your family. If you die, they will support your family, um, give you a stipend for your, for your widow, I guess. Um, and they have a guild hall for public functions. So you would, you would meet with your fellow guild members, have a banquet every year or so. Um, they would have their own chapel. They would have their own sort of um, religious bodies that prayed together. It's really very interesting, the guild structures. Sometimes they would have, you know, beautifully decorate their, their guild with the best artists that are around. Really interesting. And especially in urban places. If you look in, say, the, the lowlands, what's today Belgium, northern Italy, and big cities like Paris, London, of course, there are guilds for every trade. Every trade would have a guild, not just brewing. Um, and what happens is the guilds tend to work closely with town governments. Um, first of all, they don't want anyone to sell watered down beer or spoiled beer, anything, because the reputation of the city then declines. Um, so the uh, guild and the city governments are interested in having very standard measures, for example. They want, want to make sure no one's getting cheated. Um, and the state will control not only the price of the beer, but the price of the grain, because they don't want the, the brewers to suddenly say, oh, the price of grain has gone up, we have to charge more for the beer, and then people will buy less, thinking, oh, I don't want to spend so much, I can't afford so much beer. So, so all these price controls, this is part of the pre-modern um, economy. This is, and, and it sounds, sounds very socialist to us, doesn't it? But, it's, but this is um, you know, before the free market, before uh, supply and demand had free hand, before laissez-faire economy. Everything was very tightly controlled. And especially for the beer that, want, that has to be shipped, they want to make sure that that is superior quality because the, the wealth, the revenue of the city really depends on it. Um, and so the state's going to promote this stuff, right? They're going to be the marketing agency for the, the best stuff from the best cities. So, so again, in sum, this is not free trade. It's exactly the opposite. The state supports the industry, they help out the guilds, and the guilds manage the labor supply, the prices, and even how much beer is actually on the market at any given time. And of course, they will both control where it goes. So let me, let me give you some examples. Henry III of England in 1267 created what is one of the most important laws. It's called the Assize of Bread and Ale. Again, these are the staple foods. Uh, this regulated the quality, the price, the measure used. Uh, there would be an official... Um, every batch is actually tasted by an official to make sure it's good. They also implemented safety regulations, which is really surprising. Um, because remember, malting and boiling and there's a lot of the things catch fire easily and the government doesn't want your brewery to burn down the city, basically. So, um, and in fact, in some places, if you have not built your brewery out of stone, they will, you'll have to obtain a special license and, and they'll assure that it's safe and separate from other buildings. And generally you want your brew house to be of stone because it won't burn down entirely. Uh, something goes wrong. Um, some cities, especially in Germany, would actually arrange for something sort of like a co-op, right? They will, uh, the city will provide the building itself and sometimes even the equipment. And then the brewers could come in and brew for a certain period and then take their product. And then another brewer will come in. So that's really kind of, that's the way modern co-ops work, right? Is the, is the, um, the equipment is owned collectively and then they take turns using it here the city would own it and for beer it's it's ideal because you don't it's not like you have one harvest season where everything has to be processed one brewer could come in take out his batch another one come in then another one um and i think the uh, you know the reason that the, these arrangements often happened is copper is really expensive and copper kettles are ideal because they will heat more evenly they're sturdier they won't, they won't, um, they oxidize, but they don't rust. Like, um, you know, iron would, would be really, really bad for brewing. And it would, it, the, the acids and the alcohol would leach out. They'd make it black, basically, and really nasty. Um, but the copper uses less fuel. It's sturdier. It's much, much lighter than, than iron and other materials. And it won't, won't, uh, won't break as easily. So, so, um, but, but it's expensive, you know. Um, and, uh, so sometimes they would go into these co-op arrangements so that they could use the equipment in uh, shared. 
The state also very often supplied the, um, they, they, they taxed and controlled the supply of the kraut, the, the, the vegetable, the herbs that go in. Uh, it's called the, the krautrecht, which means that they would give one person a monopoly on the sale of the kraut, kind of as a, as a personal favor. You know, if you do a favor for the king and he doesn't have cash on hand, let's say you lend him money, he'll say, okay, good, I'll give you the right to sell the kraut, and of course you become fantastically wealthy on that. It brings, brings in a ton of revenue. Um, and this is this is actually the way governments often dealt with the lack of cash is that they would just do this um, and as a as a favor to their supporters um, and sometimes even a person would purchase that monopoly in other words if the government says well, we don't have money right now um, someone would pay money right up and then they'd give they'd sell them this monopoly and you imagine over four or five years you make enough and you make more than you paid for the monopoly and that's the way you make a profit it's not unlike selling a bond really if you think about it but it's but it's it's um, selling off um, a, for immediate cash, something that, that the government could actually have long-term revenue with, and it's not a it's not a smart thing to do for a government. Really, it makes individuals wealthy and not the government itself. So, um, but but often a government, a city city ta a town government might sell the rights um, to um, sell crowd or even to collect t taxes. Sometimes they do that. That's called tax farming. Um, but it, but it saves the government from paying an individual to have to do this, right? As a, a state functionary, it's much cheaper for them. So in any case, the other thing a state normally does, and this is absolutely central to understanding all of the, the, um, the development of long-term trade in this era, which is called mercantile, okay? The mercantilism is the economic theory that's reigning here, is that the state normally wants to restrict imports and exports, okay? They want to sell many things, products outside the city under the assumption that this is going to bring money in and they want to restrict imports because they think, oh, well, if someone's buying a product from elsewhere, our money is going out. So they will put taxes, excise duties, um, they'll try and rank, uh, you know, make the price higher for things that are coming from abroad so people won't buy them. So they buy locally or they, um, so ideally, um, if trade is taxed, um, you know, the idea is that they want, the government's going to say, we, all the stuff that's made here, we're going to encourage people to send it abroad because that, that way we're getting the money from that other country or that other city that's flowing in here. We'll become wealthier. And the government, of course, takes its cut on that in taxes. So, um, so, so the, the whole mercantile theory is, is dependent on this idea of money flowing out, uh, sorry, money flowing in and goods flowing out, but not our money flowing out. Okay, it's called bullionist, right? Bu not bouillon like uh, like bullion cubes, but bu bullion means um, gold and silver. Okay, we want money to come in. Um, so again, not free trade, anything but. Um, and what it means is that if you're a home brewer and the government is really discouraging what you do because you're not exporting and you're not large scale and whatever, it, they make it very difficult for you. Okay, so so sometimes in many and in some places actually small brewing is prohibited outright. Um, they would give it, they would for example make an, a very expensive license to brew. Um, and if you brewed over a certain quantity, they would make the cost less. <laughs> if, you, if you were a small brewer, they would say, well, we really don't want it because we can't control you and, and you're not exporting, so we can't tax you and you're not worth it to us. We're going to make it life difficult for you. That's often what happens. So, so I should mention also that the guilds sometimes could get very powerful and protect their own privileges. Um, and sometimes the state went out of their way to weaken them. Let, let me just give you a weird example of this. This is a the Brewers Company of London basically really tightly controlled uh, the trade in London in the 15th century. Um, but the uh, but foreign brewers were allowed in, but they had to operate on the other side of the river in Southwark, which is where actually where the globe was and where bear baiting and where prostitutes were found all outside the city regulations on the other side of the Thames. Um, and uh, and actually, if you recall, it's it's there. It's the Tabard Inn is where the um, Chaucer's pilgrims leave to go on a pilgrimage to Canterbury. Right. It's that it's in Southwark. It's still there, actually, weirdly enough. Um, so, so anyway, in case that's the place to go to mischief. Um, you might also know that the, the, um, the playwright um, Christopher Marlowe was killed in a tavern brawl there. Um, but in any case, the, let's, let, me, let me just give you one little more anecdote about Chaucer. Chaucer has his miller say this. Now hearkeneth, quoth the miller, all and some, but first I make a protestation uh, that I am drunk, 
I, it, by, my, son, and therefore that if I misspoke or say, white it the ale of Southwark, I, you pray. In other words, blame it on the ale that I had in Southwark because I got drunk before we left because we were all, I was waiting in the tavern too long and I couldn't, couldn't wait for you without a few drinks. So, so, but any case, this, that's the setting. That's why I'm mentioning all this stuff. So imagine you're across the other side of the river in 1478, a century after Chaucer, a uh, century before Shakespeare. It's between the two. There is a London degree that declares this decree. Um, inasmuch as the brewers of the city enhance the price of beer against the common wheel, foreign brewers should come into the city and there freely sell their beer until further order. In other words, in this case, the guild had such a cartel on it that they artificially rose the prices and the government said, uh oh, if we let them do this, the people are going to revolt against us because they can't afford beer. So let's invite in some foreigners to make beer on the other side of the river where they can buy it cheaply. All you have to do is ferry across and the government wants competition in this case. Which is, so, so I don't want you to think it's always government and guild hand in hand. Sometimes they will um, go out of their way to, to undermine the guild's control um, by doing things like inviting foreigners in. So the corollary to this is that the, um, the main way the governments also make revenue from the beer trade is not just exports, but it's licensing of alehouses, right? Where it's consumed locally, they want to get their cut on every pint that everyone drinks. So there's been a lot of discussion about why this happened. Um, I think the assumption has always been that, it, that this was a product of the Reformation, that you know was, they were consciously trying to limit consumption because of their religious attitude toward drunkenness, and, and if they made um, you know alcohol more expensive and less accessible, people would drink less and there'd be less drunkenness and rioting and sin, okay, basically. That, that's a, basically a Reformation attitude. Um, so what they did, th this argument goes, is limit the number of taverns that are allowed to be open in a city, so you, not easy access. Limit their hours of operation, so you, at a, after a certain time you can't drink. Um, these are the kind of rules that we were thinking about in class. You know, how would we, how would we uh, make things safer for people? Um, and, you know, if a tavern's in the same location of a brewery, you know, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's, the beer is bought from a supplier and then resold in a tavern. But, but you know, in a city, um, you know, it's usually a tavern that's owned and doesn't actually make the beer, but it sells it. Um, and um, in rural places, it tends to be, they still tend to be connected. But in any case, they want to control that. They want to, they want to tax it. Um, and increasingly in cities, um, establishments are separate. In other words, the brewer is a separate person from the tavern owner, and that trend tends to take over in the countryside too. Is especially when they can ship beer, they will people can buy it cheaper. So they they're thinking, why am I making this beer myself when I can just buy this stuff from the city and they'll deliver it? You know, it just makes more sense and it's cheaper. So the beer is a little more expensive. It lasts a little longer, but you don't have to spend all that time making your beer. So the general trend is again for private. Um, houses, public houses or taverns, um, and the government likes this because, again, they can control it then. They can limit the hours, they can tax every drink, and they don't have to go to a million private households to try and collect. Um, so the key here, and the key to all of these weird developments in the just about the 15th century, is, you could argue, is hops, okay? Eumulus lupulus. Um, it's a plant that serves um, practically no function really uh although you can eat the sprouts actually the hop sprouts are crunchy Aspar they're actually really good <laughs> they're slightly bitter and, and um, like asparagus kind of um but what they do is they add a bitterness to the beer counteract a sweetness and it serves as an actual preservative okay the the hops contain a resin that will stave off bacterial infection it lasts longer it can be shipped farther um and um the beer basically lasts a few months now instead of a few weeks. So you find them first being used um, well, about 1200 in northern Germany. Cities like Bremen and Hamburg start using it. Um, in fact, the Hanseatic cities that I mentioned last time, they tend to use hops because they, are, they do begin exporting beer um, early on. Um, 
And along with river, you know, they have rivers and good ports and they sell in the Baltic by and large. So they start using hops first. Um, and with hopped beer also, they can sometimes sit on the, they can store the beer for a while, wait for better prices and then send it where it's gonna fetch the highest price. That's, you know, key to mercantile strategy. Um, it didn't need to be sold immediately. Uh, situation as a port also meant that towns like Hamburg could import grain. And what they generally do is they'll buy the grain where it's really cheap on the other side of the Baltic, where there's still, you know, very heavy serfdom and oppression, and then they'll bring it back um, and uh, and export the beer. And um, much of this, um, you know, the, the, the city that really emerges as the powerhouse is one that actually pushes out the Baltic cities in the beer trade. And this is Amsterdam. Amsterdam is absolutely central to this process. Um, and, uh, you know, the, uh, there's a, the, actually a, a few centuries of battle between the um, rulers of the Scandinavian countries who are sending the raw materials and the Hanseatic League, which is sending beer, and Amsterdam, which we'll see capitalizes and muscles in on that trade and basically pushes them out and um, makes a superior kind of hopped beer. Um, so hops, of course, in this process, uh, replace the kraut. And in fact, if you've ever heard of the um, the German Reinheitsgebot, which is 1516, it is a law which prohibits the use of any ingredient in beer apart from barley, hops, and water. And you'll see that cited in ads all the time, though of course now they do add yeast also. Um, but the hops are, this is a way to force the use of hops and not kraut, um, because it makes a long longer lasting product but you have to spend money on the kraut on the on the hops right so the hops spread um let's let's follow this just chronologically for a bit the hops spread to holland in uh, after 1321 because the count of holland actually officially gives permission to use it then um thereafter the dutch kind of you know slowly begin to take over the in, the export business from the germans and right about this time england also gets hops from them this the, the earliest record i think is 1438 um and they start creating a product which they start calling beer okay as opposed to they want to distinguish it from their local ale they have this new stuff called beer okay um and there's long been a notion that the hopped beer came to England from the lowlands, meaning the Netherlands, now uh, the Netherlands and Belgium, and that it came in the same at the same time as the Reformation. In other words, when people, in the course of the Reformation, a lot of people escaped and went to England, that hops came with them. In fact, there's a little rhyme that says, Turkey, heresy, hops, and beer came into England all in one year. Um, but it, it's not true. It was there before. Um, and the, but the English, English industry did actually take off in the 15th century, and they even began to export beer to Holland, strangely enough, um, when Fines Morrison, who's this really interesting uh, traveler, goes through Europe in the early 17th century, he says, you know, the English beer dominates the market. <laughs> we've, we've begun to, you can find it in all over the place. Well, I'll, I'll read you a little, little piece of his, um, his diary. The English beer is famous in the Netherlands and lower Germany. Uh, it's made of barley and hops for England, yields plenty of hops. The, the um, climate is ideal there, just like it is in, say, Oregon and even places in California grow hops. The city of Lower Germany upon the sea forbid the public selling of English beer to satisfy their own brewers, yet privately they swallow it like nectary, like nectar. In other words, the, the town is trying to say, let's prevent everyone from drinking the English beer, but they somehow they get it anyway. Um, but the Netherland great and incredible quantity thereof is spent, um, meaning that Dutch really like English beer and they get it. Um, another very important factor here, and I'm just going to throw this into the whole mix, is, um, is actually the plague also. Uh, the plague struck in 1348 to 49. It was in the first mass epidemic, it wiped out a third of the population of Europe. And it caused this dramatic shift in the whole economy. Um, at first, there's dislocation, there's turmoil, but gradually some very odd things happen. Let me explain this. Um, of course, because you have a third less people, the price of labor goes way up, right? I mean, you know, fewer workers around, they can demand higher wages, okay? Because, and the people who need their labor have to pay more if they want to get them. And this, in turn, led to increased expendable income for most people, right? Most people now have more money because their wages are better and they can buy more luxury goods. 
Um, let's imagine that the wealth is actually spread around more evenly after the plague. I know that sounds really bizarre, but if you're a survivor, you do fairly well, right? You can move into your relatives' houses, or dead, you can, you know, um, you get a better job. Um, and what we know as a fact is that meat consumption rises in the latter 14th and 15th century. The um, quality, luxury products, the market for those increases. Um, and of course, import a beer also. You could buy better beer if you have more money. Um, and you even, you even see all this in cookbooks, right? You, you find meat consumption, uh, cookbooks selling to a middling ground, middle, let's say middle classes um, are buying more stuff. Um, and second, because there are actually fewer people, the demand for the basic staples actually goes down. Um, means that growers, of people who are growing things like grain and basic staples are not making as much money. So that sort of levels the playing field, let, let's imagine. It's a great situation for brewers, actually, uh, because the grain is cheap and people are willing to buy this, let's call it value-added product that is beer, right? And consume it in that form, because grain is fine, but at home, what are you going to do? Make it into mush or buy flour, make it into bread. But beer is actually more processed and more valuable. Um, something else I think also influences the growth of beer in the 15th century, and we'll, we'll get to this, especially when we get to the 16th, is that the long trend toward global warming, which we saw after the year 1000, begins to reverse especially when we get to the 16th century. So places which were growing wine, like Flanders, modern-day Belgium, England, um, increasingly they can't grow wine anymore, wine grapes, and they, of course, switch to beer production. Um, and in fact, by the 16th, 17th century, we have what some climatologists and historians call a little ice age in the early modern period, in which um, viticulture is really destroyed in the marginal regions, um, and barley, you know, barley, remember, is really, really tough. It'll grow in cold weather. Um, and it, it eventually takes its place in many, many regions. Um, and what is, uh, what seems to have happened is that the German dominance of the beer export um, in the latter Middle Ages also is gradually lost. Once the lowlands, Amsterdam and, and the Belgian cities um, still make great beer, um, and England start to make their own beer and then export it uh, or, or consume it themselves. They don't need the German beer. And this is true also Scandinavia also begins to um, grow more of their own, um, make more of their own beer and buy less of German. So we'll come back to this period. We'll, when we get to the early modern period, I'll give you the, all the details of the whole thing. But let me just at this point raise the question whether any of these processes really did make the beer better. Okay, now there's a tacit assumption I think among many historians of alcohol and of beer, that the addition of hops makes a better product because it's more stable, right? It won't go bad so often, it can travel further, it's, um, and they argue that the taste is improved by the hops because you get a nice bitterness out of it. Um, and we're actually in a period now that loves hops, okay? The same argument is often made in the 19th century when pasteurization, when bottling, when the ability to keep the beer cold and keep the carbonation in and make a kind of fizzy, lovely, refreshing beer that we enjoy today, people will often say, well, this is all improvement because we have a better product, better suited for the marketplace and for, for trade. Well, both of these things, you know, they're not related, but both of these, these uh, processes in the late Middle Ages and 19th century certainly make beer more stable, can sit on a shelf longer. But think about what it does to the unique character of the beer. Um, beer, the more it is processed, the less it really needs to be fresh. As I said, the colder it gets, the less it needs to taste good, right? Um, mass production does create a more homogenous product and one that's predictable, right? So you're not gonna have odd batches, but it also tends to lower the product to the lowest common denominator, or at least the bulk of beer. Um, and I think this is certainly an argument that craft brewers make today is that they can 
express the place more more consistently they can experiment they can be quirky and odd and sometimes come up with beers that are exquisite now i have to say most craft i think almost all craft breweries do pasteurize anyway so they're they're boiling their beer at the end and and uh, capping it up so it doesn't go bad because if it goes bad their business is dead but still i think they can capture you know i wonder if the logic that craft brewers are speaking of today about the value of brewing locally, consuming fresh, knowing your brewer, right? Does that apply to the Middle Ages also? When we're thinking about medieval beer, it's a product that is always small scale, right? Um, to start, made in homes, consumed quickly. And of course, it's gonna change season to season. It's gonna change because of the weather, the change in ingredients, the subtle shifts in production methods. Every batch is gonna be a little bit different. And once in a while, you'll get something that's truly exceptional, right? Um, now, is that a better situation than consistency and you know the status quo all the time? I don't know. It, um, but I want you to just to start thinking about this because it, it obviously applies to mo the modern era is does scale and consistency always mean improvement? Or what's more, what is ultimately more valuable? What can you actually charge more for? Our, our current era would say, yeah, the local, the quirky, the variable, the unique, the really interesting product actually can, you can get more for it. Um, but are those products, those craft brews and craft, that well, applies to all food really, right? You know, bread, cheese, whatever. Um, what happens when those end up scaling up and becoming themselves huge industries <laughs> and you know um and does the word craft always mean that okay um so let, let let's um from for a while just ponder that let's for a while also talk about the social context of beer consumption there are um many different places people consume beer one is of course at the home with meals the other is at a public event, what would have been called, at least in England, a church ale. Yeah, the church sponsored these. Uh, it would be a holiday or a, or a carnival, a public event of some kind where they would serve beer. Um, and the last, of course, is a private um, consumption in a tavern, right, which is, which is sort of semi-public, like almost anyone can walk into the place. But the, um, I mean, the, the, but the proprietor can technically reser uh, refuse you service if he doesn't like you or you look dangerous or whatever. It's a privately owned space, right? Um, so the general pattern here is for consumption to shift from the communal event to the regulated and taxed alehouse where drinking is more strictly controlled. The transition is usually also put in the context of the transition from medieval communal life with its free beer bashes sponsored largely by the church to an early modern crackdown on drunken revels as indecorous and, um, and wanting commercial operations to take their place because they could control them more. Um, so the, again, the, the idea is the state encourages this because they can tax alehouses. It is also said that the church influenced this shift because of the Reformation era. The church doesn't want to be serving beer anymore <laughs> and the, the whole liability issue, right? Um, but the picture is a lot more com complicated than that. But let's, but let's start with what this communal kind of beer event would be, the free and the drunken. So across Europe, and this applies not just to, to beer, this is wine also, um, there would be day, holy days scattered around the calendar. Um, and keep in mind, people don't have day, weekends off like we do. Uh, instead, there'd be festivals, and they might be, you know, dedicated to the local patron saint or a special date, or it might have to do with a harvest or or what uh, what's called rogation tide, which was when you walk around the fields. That's April twenty fifth. Um, it's a fertility rite, actually, uh, and goes all the way back to Christian times, right? Um, May Day is actually a kind of is one of those kind of pre Christian um, fertility rites. Um, so is All Hallows Eve, so is Twelfth Night, so is Epiphany, which is uh, January 6th, um, commemorating the Magi. So, um, but in England, you know, these are all occasions to drink and, and sing and dance, mumming, you know, there'd be people who dancing. Um, and you might know that the, the tune, wassail, wassail, all over the town, our toast it is white, our ale it is brown, our bowl it is made of the white maple tree, with a wassailing bowl, we'll drink to thee, you know, that's a, we, we sing it at Christmas time now, but it's, but it's, it sort of captures this public um, drinking ritual. People would gather in these rituals at church, 
whether they're in a rural village, whether they're on a feudal estate, whether it's the neighborhood parish church in a town or city, they, they would be provided with free drink as part of the festival. Okay? And the church has money, it, it buys all this stuff. Um, the most important of these is carnival. Okay? Let's uh, call it Fat Tuesday, Mardi Gras, it's the same thing, which is the last day preceding Lent when all the meat has to be consumed uh, prior to a fast which lasts 40 days. Um, now by fasting I mean they can't consume meat, cheese, or dairy products and they're supposed to be penitent in that whole period leading up to Easter. Okay? Um, but before that happens you've got carnival, right? A day of ritual subversion, a day when all the normal rules of social propriety are suspended, you get to mock your superiors, and in fact there are mock trials held uh, to make fun of the lawyers and administrators and priests and you know, mock weddings, things like that. So the idea is that everyone in the village participates in these and any sort of pent up anxieties you may have been harboring throughout the year can be vented on this one special day. The people are also normally masked. Well, let me show you one. Actually, you can see it right up there in the corner, the little mask, <laughs> that's, that's one. Um, and the idea is that it, you're pretending to be anonymous during this day. It should sound familiar to you from the rites to Dionysus, which we know very little about what actually went on. These we know a whole lot about. Um, so in any case, everyone knows who you are for real, but it symbolizes this idea that you're protected from retribution if you say something or do something bad uh, about someone, you know. So, so people accept, empower, actually accept this. They say, well, let's let these people go berserk one day a year. Um, and it's suggested that this is a kind of social safety valve. Um, if you want to read the, the classic um, source of this idea, it's uh, Michel Bakhtin, which is um, about a book about Rabelais, actually. Um, but the idea is that once this whole thing is over, the whole social structure goes back into place. Everyone is then deferent again. Everyone tips their hat to my lord, and the social order is actually reinforced if they have this one day to blow off steam and act completely crazy. Um, and there's lots of violence, there's sex, there's, you know, the, the, the birth rate usually spikes six, uh, nine months after carnival, which is really interesting. So people are getting busy also. Um, now what happens is these festivals are gradually banned throughout Europe in the 16th century, partly because they're looked at as pagan. They're, they're, um, <laughs> they are in fact. Um, and the, there's, and people are thinking, well, if this is a Christian holiday, we can't let people run amok. Uh, but more importantly, because they actually broke out into real violence. Um, now when things are very good, you know, in the latter Middle Ages, for ordinary people, uh, dated release tensions with some drunken riots, that's fine, right? But when they become really dangerous, when people really start to think rebellion and take over, you know, and burn your landlord's house down, well, the situation then becomes much more scarce. Um, <clears throat> and that happens, of course, in the 16th century in the era of Reformation. We're not that year, there yet in the course. But what I'm just, just sort of telling you that, that the carnivals and these things are really a late medieval phenomenon. They begin to be dismantled in the 16th century. Um, Read Peter Burke's um, Popular Culture in Early Modern Europe. You get a good sense of how this and why this happens. Um, and increasingly, festivals are shut down. In fact, the ones that you may be familiar with, like New Orleans and uh, Venice and Rio de Janeiro, those are really revivals, okay? And in place of all those public revels, what takes its place is the public house, a pub, okay? That's where that word comes from. Um, and it's seen as, as a symptomatic of a society that shifts from the communal open field structure to one that is increasingly commercial and capitalist, where all of your entertainment is for sale. And the public institutions, the grassroots public institutions, really vanish. Um, or, or another way to think of it is alehouses replace the church as the center of popular culture. And it's, of course, true of drinking culture also. So let me conclude this le lecture with a bit of blasphemy. Okay? Our lager, which art in barrels, hallowed be thy drink. Thy will be drunk, I will be drunk, at home as I am in the tavern. Give us this day our foamy head, and forgive us our spillages, as we forgive those who spill against us. And lead us not to incarceration, but deliver us from hangovers, for thine is the beer, the bitter, and the lager. 
forever and ever barmen. <laughs> okay, we'll talk more about this later.